Next up, we have Iris Omar, uh, who's going to talk about bi bidirectionally typed structured editing and how that's related to gradual types. Okay, thanks. Um, just a second. Okay, so uh, so this is a talk about program editors, which uh, isn't really a topic that um, is often discussed at Powell. Uh, so this work is really kind of presented in the belief that maybe it should change, that there are, in fact, interesting um, mathematical structures and reasoning principles that we need to work out to develop a uh, sort of science of editor design um, comparable to the science of language design that you know, has emerged over, over decades. Um, so if we're talking about reasoning principles for program editors, um, you have to ask the question, what is it that program editors reason about? And the answer isn't exactly programmed, right? Because programs are these things that are given meaning by language definitions, and they're sort of what you get at, you know, when you're done with programming. But during the act of programming, uh, what the editor and the programmer using the editor must reason about is actually, you know, structure that might look more like like this. So in an actual program editor, you might be writing a function, and it's not even tactically well-formed yet. Right? It's just some text um, that in your mind is going to become a program, but it isn't anything formally like a program quite yet. Um, the reasoning about this kind of thing, this arbitrary piece of text, is, is, uh, is difficult, right? It's just the language definition is silent about this. Um, so editor designers have to come up with, or editor engineers really, end up coming up with a number of approaches for sort of dealing with this. Um, there's various error recovery heuristics that uh, attempt to sort of insert placeholders or holes into, uh, into, uh, into the text, so that it's a tree again. Um, sometimes it's in the external representation, sometimes it's in the editor internal representation, and so you end up with this term with holes in it, or syntax tree with holes in it. Um, and so then you get back into something that at least you can sort of treat as a tree. Um, another approach, and the one that's sort of more relevant to this talk, a little cleaner, I think, is, uh, is to develop a structure editor, and that's an editor where instead of doing this in direction through text, uh, you just skip that and edit the tree structure of the program directly. Um, so there's a lot of history here. It started sort of in the 80s with the Cornell Program Synthesizer, and it's gone on into the present day. There's lots of interesting projects out there today, um, things like Scratch for teaching programming to kids and better for professional programming tasks. Um, Lambda is a Haskell-like language that's a structure editor as well. Um, so a lot of this work is mostly focused on addressing um, various HCI inter interaction design kind of issues. Um, and in this talk, I don't want to talk a lot about HCI or interaction design. Uh, I'll just say that there's, there's been a lot of interesting progress. I think um, modern keyboard-driven structure editors can be really highly productive. Um, but I really want to talk about reasoning. And so um, the, the first question that comes up is, OK, somehow, either by error recovery or using a structure editor, you have the term with holes. How do you reason statically about it? In other words, how do you reason about types in the present holes? Um, so for this specific example, there's this function, summary stats, but it's not, it's not a complete function yet. It has a couple of holes in its body. It turns, it looks like it's going to be a record, right? Um, so can we, can we assign this function a type so that later on in the program, even though it's not done yet, we can still use it and get some perhaps editor services uh, that, that, that need to know about the type of this um, function to still work? And so... Um, intuitively, the answer should be yes, right? There's a lot of information in this incomplete function definition. You know, we know that the input is a matrix, and we know that this record has three, uh, three fields and what their labels are, and the first, uh, the first field is, doesn't have any hole in it, so we should figure, be able to figure out its type. Um, so um, that's sort of the first contribution of, of this paper, is, is coming up with a static semantics or a type system for these functions with holes. And what happens is um, this function gets this, this arrow type, takes a matrix, returns a record. Um, the, the first two fields in standard deviation, deviation um, there's enough there already, even though there's a hole in, in the standard deviation computation, to know that the, the, the things are going to end up being, and once you do fill in the, the holes that are there, um, vectors, which, which happens to be the return type of the, those functions there. Um, for the median computation, however, there's just nothing there. There's just a hole there. I don't know what type that's going to be. There's no type annotation or anything on this function to tell me. 
Um, and so the way we the way we handle that is uh, there's holes in the types as well. So it's not just holes in expressions, but holes in types. And and so this um, uh, this whole expression is assigned this whole type. Um, Another thing that comes up when you are talking reasoning statically about these complete programs is what happens when there's a type error somewhere in the program. Um, again, a standard language definition just says, you know, if there's a type error anywhere in the program, the whole program is statically meaningless, right? Even if you're working elsewhere. And so we don't want to. We don't want that. Um, we need to somehow handle these, these type errors here. There's a string instead of uh, some value of some some type, and um, so how do we handle that? Well, actually, that's just sort of very similar to just there being a hole there. It's something that we're, we're not done yet. Uh, before, we weren't done because there was nothing there. Here, we're not done because there's something incorrect there. Um, but formally, we end up treating these as, as not empty holes. So we end up reifying the type inconsistency. We end up essentially treating that uh, red underline as a part of the syntax and assigning its, it meaning. And it ends up behaving a lot like a hole except it's not, there's something in it. Um, so in, you get, a, you get a, a type for this function, even though there's not only a hole in it, but also a type inconsistency in it. And that's because there is something there that we know about the function. Um, so formally in the paper, there's a static semantics for a, a very simple lambda calculus with, with holes, including not empty holes for type inconsistencies. Um, so that's the syntax for it. It's, it just has it just has numbers and functions, and then holes in the type at the type level, and then holes at the expression level, including non-empty holes. Um, we don't need non-empty holes in this calculus at the type level because there's no no malformed uh, all the all the types no type variables. But you you would need something up there comparable if, if there were. Um, and then the semantics. Uh, we happen to, to use a bidirectional style of specifying the static semantics, and really that has more to do with the next contribution, but um, it's one way to do things, and, and, and the way that works is essentially instead of one typing judgment, you have these two mutually defined typing judgments. One um, talks about uh, when you can synthesize a type by looking at an expression. The expression has enough information there to, to tell what uh, to synthesize a type from it. The other is when uh, you're in analytic position, or you know what the type, what the expected type is. The type is an input in that case. Um, it tells you how to check expression against the type. Um, and I won't, I won't show you all the rules that are in the paper, but uh, the key rules are really that whole expressions synthesize whole types, and the non-empty whole, or the, t the type inconsistency, just requires that there is some type to be assigned inside. It's just an inconsistent, potentially an, incons an inconsistent one. And how do those inconsistencies arise? Well, when you, um, when synthesis sort of meets analysis, you have this standard assumption rule in bidirectional systems that say if you can analyze something against a type, if it can synthesize some, synthesize that type, or in this case, um, some type that is consistent with it. And what does it mean for a type to be consistent with another type? Um, we need this notion because we want holes to be. Uh, we want it to be allowable to put a hole anywhere uh, in a type that anything else could have been, or th uh, that the right thing could have been. Um, so uh, what ends up looking like is this relation between types, where a hole is consistent with any type, and it's symmetric. Um, so it, uh, it's unlike a, a subtyping relation. It's a symmetric relation. And it's reflexive. Um, it's not transitive. Otherwise, any you know you don't want you don't want to be able to jump through holes and get from anywhere to anywhere else. Um, so um, this notion of uh, type consistency actually uh, sort of arises or coincides with the notion of type, in, type consistency uh, in, in work on gradual typing. And so uh, it's this exact relation. Some of the other machinery that I haven't shown you is also um, sort of uh, taken from gradual typing literature. And so that's kind of an interesting relationship because gradual typing is sort of posed as it also poses this sort of gradual program development sort of process, um, but but here there's nothing you know there's no um, there's no dynamic checks or anything that we're talking about here. It's just that this machinery ends up being useful for just talking statically about uh, incomplete programs. Okay, so that's um, that's just kind of a high level overview of how the static semantics for these terms with holes works. Um, 
the, the, the paper title promised you an editor calculus, and so it's not enough to just talk about individual edit states. Uh, you want to talk about transitions between edit states, the edit actions, the semantics of edit actions well. And um, so we also have uh, typed edit action semantics. And so this kind of diagrams what it looks like. Um, pretty straightforward, right? You have a, a sequence of actions, alpha, uh, that transition you between edit states. And what's uh, unique about this um, structure editor is, not, is that it doesn't just maintain some sort of syntactic well informedness. Um, but it also maintains uh, the ability to reason statically out every edit state. And so every edit state has a type. Um, and so yeah, it's, a, it's an expression pair of the type. Um, if you're looking closely, you might notice these little hats on top of the E's. And that's just because an edit state is not just an expression with holes, but it's, it's an expression with holes. That was an E dot on the previous slide. Superposed um, with a cursor, a single cursor. So that's, that's a notion of a cursor that you need in the edit state for, for a standard editor. Um, so and so I, I want to just show you the, uh, our, our, our implementation to give you a feeling for how this works. Um, OK, so um, you can go online and play with this yourself at some point if you want. But I'll just show you a couple of simple examples. Um, so, so uh, down here are the edit actions. They're all just buttons. They have also keyboard shortcuts associated with them. If you want, I'll click buttons so that you can see what's going on. Um, so let's just start by um, you know, creating a number, let's say, a number literal. So we can put in um, five here. Um, we can put an description on it. And because these actions are type aware, it, it knows that that description must be numb, so just pressing colon puts the description on it. That's if you want to document it, for example. Um, we, can, we can move around, we can move this first around using these tree-based movement actions. Um, and then we can also delete things, so let's start over. Um, we, can, we can start with the description first, construct the number here, move to the first uh, child, and then we can construct the literal, and that's fine. Um, now what happens when we construct a description and we say we want a num arrow num, and then we go up here and we still we say let's construct a literal. Um, so what happens is it does put a five there, but not not a bare five. It puts the five in a hole, and that's so that's remember these non-empty holes are these reified type inconsistencies. So this says I'm not going to prevent you from putting a five down when you want a num arrow num. But I'm going to, you know, wrap up and, and make sure that I've indicated correctly that this thing isn't actually yet a num arrow num. Um, and then let's just actually make a num arrow num. Um, so I can make a lambda binding x. Uh, not in the right spot yet. And then. Let's, let's create, make an X. Here I put, if I put a, if I put a Y here, it knows that there isn't a Y in scope and it doesn't even let you put it down. X plus one. All right. So now this language is obviously extremely simple. You can do much more than add some numbers together and some functions around those additions. But uh, you, get, you get the idea. And, and like I said, this isn't to you know, win any AGI awards. This is a sort of reference implementation of the calculus. Um, so back to the slide. Um, but what's happening there um, is that there is some, now, now we need some uh, semantic for these edit actions, and, and we need some more syntactic elements to do that. Let me just give you a brief overview of, of those things. Um, so the first thing you need is some notion of a, a cursor superimposed on uh, an H expression, an expression with holes. And we call that a Z expression just because it uses the zipper pattern, uh, Hewitt's zipper pattern. Um, so just the, the details aren't that important, but essentially you just, this, uh, this inductive grammar just ensures that there's exactly one of these cursors in every term. And the way it does that is that well, every, uh, only one subterm can have a hat on it, basically. So it tells you the path in towards the cursor. Um, and then you need some grammar for actions. And so we just have a really primitive set of actions. And that's intentional. Um, we have movement actions in, in up-down directions and construction actions, deletion, 
and this finish thing, which uh, which allows you to explicitly say when a hole is done, uh, when the string consistency is gone, you can perform a finish action on it. And that's explicit in this calculus, but it would be implicit in practice. Um, and then the uh, and then the semantics of edit actions themselves are like the static semantics defined bidirectionally. So there's a pair of mutually defined um, judgments that um, tell you how each of these actions operate and when they can operate. So again, I'm not going to show you all the rules. There's quite a few of them for all these constructions and so on. But um, let me just show you how this construct lit works. Um, so this this judgment says that um, if you start from this state e hat which synthesizes this type tau dot, then, and you perform alpha, then you end up with this new edit state, e hat prime, that synthesizes some new type tau, tau dot prime. And so for construct lit, you can put a literal in empty hole, which synthesizes the, the whole type, as we talked about before, and you end up with that literal synthesizing the num type. So that, that should be pretty straightforward. Um, so th there's a bunch of actions like these for when, when you can see the cursor, right? You can see the cursor right there on that hole. Uh, and then there's a bunch of what we call zipper rules, which kind of recurse into the zipper structure for when the cursor's not at the very top, essentially, right? So, um, example for plus, it perform an action on plus, and, and the cursor isn't right on the plus. Uh, it's in, the, it's in, in this example, it's in the left sub-expression. Then um, you recurse into the left sub-expression, pass the alpha along. Um, but because the argument to plus has to be a num, we don't use the synthetic version of the rule, we use the analytic version of the rule here. So we, we have to pin the, we have to make sure that this, uh, this action doesn't change the type from what it has to be because it's in the plus position. Um, and so that's what the analytic rule does. And the analytic rule, like the analytic rule in the static semantics has a subsumption rule associated with it. Um, and so this, this works a lot like the subsumption rule in the stats. I won't go into the details. Um, but this allows you to, to go back to the synthetic side if you need to. And then there's also a special case here for when you want to construct the lit. And the lit is uh, being analyzed against some type that's not compatible with the num type. So the error type in the example that I showed you. And there uh, it does this hole insertion. Right? It doesn't just put the n there. It puts the n inside these. Um, purple brackets. Uh, that means that there's a type inconsistency. Um, so that's, yeah, again, that's just the basic idea there. Um, so what's interesting here is actually that this whole insertion is happening sort of uh, by the action. And it's not, it's not that there's some um, pass after the action changes the syntax tree that checks if there's a syntax error and inserts the red underline for you. Uh, and so it's 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 uh, it's interesting because it's sort of intrinsically or by construction it's incremental. There's no whole program pass on every edit action by construction, and and that's that's that can only happen because of the bidirectional nature of of this calculus. So if you if you did want to do you know ML style inference on this, I think you could come up with action semantics for it. But whole insertion would have to be a, a a different sort of process. Um, and so the bidirectionality, the locality of the type inference in the bidirectional system is, is giving you locality of action in the edit semantics as well. Okay, and then um, I just want to briefly give an overview of some of the meta theorems because this is a calculus. It allows us to prove things about, about the calculus, make sure we, we uh, defined it correctly. Um, so one is the sensibility invariant that just says that what, what I've been talking about, that every edit action leaves your um, uh, edit state well typed. I won't go into the details of the statements of the theorems. And there's a couple of others that sort of establish the expressiveness of your action semantics. One is reachability theorem that says the cursor can reach any portion in the program. That makes sure that you haven't forgotten any movement rules. There's another one that says any well-typed expression can be constructed using edit actions. And that helps you make sure you haven't forgotten any construction rules. Uh, and all of these meta theorems have been um, mechanized in the Agda proof assistant. Uh, so we're quite sure that they're true. And um, that's it. So the summary is we've uh, developed this editor calculus hazelnut that has a static semantic for terms with holes and type inconsistencies and action semantics. Uh, we have this implementation which was in a browser, it was written in OCaml with a very direct sort of transcription of the inference rules that are in the paper uh, and compiled using JS of OCaml. And we have this rich meta theory mechanized in Agda that establishes the 
correctness of hazelnut and, and helps guide you when you extend the calculus with more expressive power. So we did an example in the paper of some types, and I'll direct you to the paper for that. Um, and so, going, so, so we really want this to be a foundation for, for interesting work in uh, or the science of editor design. So we're going to work on this um, sort of full-scale editor called Hazel, hopefully going forward. And um, I think I'm running out of time here, so maybe I'll just leave this slide up and you can guess what some of these things might require us to do. Questions? Hello, this is Jeremy Seek. Um, really fun to see gradual typing getting used this way. It's, it's a really neat application. Um, there's also a connection with meta programming, like with quote and quasi quote kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, so this is reminding me of some work that I did uh, a while back on incremental type checking for meta programming. And ironically, in that work, I didn't use gradual typing. Instead, I was thinking in terms of inference. So your, your comments earlier about <laughs> inference are interesting. Um, and what we did was you basically had a, like a fresh unification variable for every unknown spot. Uh, and that allowed us to have sort of, sort of richer type information and richer sharing than what you'd get with gradual typing. Yeah. But uh, maybe there's some downsides to that approach applied mm -hmm. in this context, uh, as you mentioned earlier. But. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, there's another approach where, so, so there are, you can get yourself into a situation where there's no way to fill in the holes such that you'll end up with a well-typed program. Right. And you don't detect that. There's no constraint system right now to, to help you, you know, determine whether that's the case. And I think that would be interesting kind of step to take is um, going into a constraint-based system for these type holes. And yeah, so I'll leave that as future work, I guess. A uh, question, uh, Dave Sands here. Um, so the idea of holes, they're things at the leaves of the syntax tree. And so that gives a very top-down view of the construction of syntactic terms. Um, but if you want a more bottom-up view, then what you need is the idea of a hole which is further up the tree. Um, in, in a sense, context hole, a syntactic <coughs> context holes. Uh, have you thought about this? Is this something that maybe is needed? Uh, so I'm not quite sure I understand.